Hello, my name is Jonathan Sullivan, and I'm the Director of Catechetical Ministries for the Diocese of Springfield in Illinois. This is a recording of a webinar my office presented in April of 2010, entitled Catechizing Digital Natives. I'd like to begin this recording with a brief prayer based on the writings of St. Augustine. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Loving Father, May everything we do begin with your inspiration and continue with your saving help. Let our work always find its origin in you and through you reach completion. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to give you a quick breakdown of this webinar and kind of what to expect. We're going to start by defining exactly what we mean when we talk about a digital native. So we'll kind of give ourselves a, at least a working understanding of who the digital natives are. We'll dispel a few myths about the digital natives that sometimes get circulated. We'll ask the question, how do digital natives learn and how does that differ from previous generations? And finally, I'll give a few uh, suggestions and examples for how to use that in our catechetical programs. I do want to give a quick word first though, uh, just to say that I am not an expert in pedagogy by any means. Uh, my background is primarily in theology. Uh, however, I do have a passion for using new technologies for passing on our Catholic faith to the next generation. So I really think we need to have some sort of understanding of the uh, times in which uh, digital natives have grown up if we're going to really do an adequate job of passing on the faith to them. So that's kind of the angle that I'm coming from. I'll be referencing a lot of articles and tools and websites throughout this webinar uh, and I'll give you a URL where you can find links to all of those at the end. So to start with we need to ask the question who are the digital natives? The term digital natives was coined by Mark Pensky in his seminal article, Digital Natives, Digital Immigrants. And what Mark Pensky was trying to do in that article was kind of develop an analogy that would help us to understand the differences between uh, past generations and this new generation that's coming up. Uh, Pensky really believes that this new generation is different from others just because of the technologies that they have not only been exposed to but have been using since very young ages. And so he drew this analogy of uh, natives and immigrants to a country. So if you think of a native to a country, the native doesn't question a whole lot about the country. He doesn't have a whole lot of questions. He knows what's going on. He knows the language. He knows the religion. He knows the folk traditions. Uh, knows how things are done in a country. Uh, it's you know like a fish in water. He doesn't even think about it half the time. Uh, it's just part of who he is and part of what's ingrained in his very being. An immigrant, on the other hand, when they come to a new country, suddenly has to find themselves adapting and assimilating uh, the old way of doing things from the old country into this new situation. So they act a little bit differently. They sound a little bit differently. They have an accent. And Penske even uses that term accent to talk about the way that older people will use technology because they use technology in a different way. They're trying to use the old methods of doing things in this new technology. So Penske will talk about a digital immigrant, someone who may not necessarily be comfortable in this new digital world, doing things like printing out emails to read them. You know, a digital native will just read it on the screen, whereas an, uh, an immigrant will print them out to read them. Or they'll call someone up and ask, hey, did you get that email I sent? Well, you sent it. You don't need to call and ask. Uh, you know, that would be kind of the response of a digital native. Why are you even calling me to ask? If you have, you know, if you're going to call anyway, just call and tell me what you wanted to tell me in the email. So that's, you know, kind of the accent that's employed by digital immigrants in this new digital world. Now if we actually look at kind of a typical digital immigrant, I think we can get, get kind of a picture of just how immersed in this new technology they are. So if you think about the typical 2010 high school graduate, uh, here's a couple facts about them. Someone who is a, a current high school senior is younger than the World Wide Web. They were still in diapers when the DVD was invented. They were nine years old when the iPod was introduced. Probably had one when they were nine years old, too. They were in seventh grade when Facebook uh, opened its doors to, to high school students. Before that, it was just restricted to college students. So they've always had Facebook available to them as a, as a high school student. 
And the phone that fits in the palm of their hand is 128 times more powerful than the computer that sat on their parents' desk before they were born. So not only are digital natives uh, immersed in technologies in ways that we've just never seen before, but they uh, have access to just huge amounts of raw computing power so that the things that they can do with those tools are much more sophisticated than uh, previous generations even had that, that did have a computer sitting on their desk. So that's just, you know, that that's just mind-blowing to think that, you know, just in 20 years that what would be 128 desktop computers can now fit into the palm of your hand. You know, that's that's just a, a radical transition. And so we, we've got to expect that that's had some sort of impact on uh, young people who've been exposed to this from a very young age. So when we're talking about a digital native, we're talking about someone who's typically born after 1980. That's usually the cutoff. You know, there might be some exceptions for people whose parents maybe were computer scientists or something like that, but post-1980 is usually where you'll find the, the natives being born. We're talking about young people who have spent their entire lives watching television, playing video games, chatting in uh, chat rooms on computers, texting on their cell phones, using email, Skype, Twitter. You know, th this is the way they communicate. It's, it's just the tools that they've always had available to them. They can't imagine any other world. I mean, for for me, I, I still consider Skype to be just a revolutionary technology. To them, it's old hat. They're already looking on to the next thing. As a result, scientists have begun to theorize, and, and the evidence that we have is beginning to suggest, that digital natives' brains are, are wired slightly differently than previous generations. They've had to adapt to all this information that's just kind of being thrown at them from these different media. And so they've had to learn and adapt to ways to, to sifting through that data, to pulling out the relevant bits. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, my point right now, though, is just to say that this rewiring of the brain is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, you know, we, we think about this sort of radical change that might be occurring in neuroscience between younger and older generations. It's different, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. I think there's, there's some positives and there are some negatives, and we'll talk about those in a little while. Uh, but, you know, just to say that it, it's there, and regardless, it, it presents a challenge for educators and catechists. You know, if, if, if the way that digital natives take in and, and process information is different than the strategies that, you know, we used in, in previous generations may not be the best strategies to use with digital natives. So that's just something that we need to be aware of. Digital natives, uh, you know, in terms of communication, are primarily going to be using those technological means of, of communications in, in pretty major ways. A recent survey showed that 44% of young people under the age of 25 have a social networking profile. Uh, and often in multiple sites too, so they're not may not just be on Facebook, but might be on Facebook and LinkedIn or MySpace and something else. So, you know, they've they've got multiple streams going for their online presence. Eighty-six percent said that they love how technology connect connects them to other people, and ninety percent say that they often use different technologies at the same time. So that sort of stereotypical image of a teenager with his uh, iPo iPhone, iPod hooked into his ears, uh, chatting with someone on the computer while texting on his cell phone. Uh, you know, 90% say that, yeah, they, they often use different technologies at the same time. Now, this is different from digital immigrants. Uh, and I just want to point out that that doesn't necessarily mean that a digital immigrant is technologically illiterate. Uh, and a good example is actually my father-in-law, who's a computer scientist, spent years running the library systems uh, for some of the major private universities in Indiana. Uh, he is you know, one of the most technologically literate and competent people I know, you know, runs circles around uh, a lot of younger people. Uh, but he's still a digital immigrant because it's not uh, the culture in which he grew up. You know, it's not ingrained in him the same way it is for someone who grew up with these technologies being at their fingertips. Uh, it's, you know, for the, the digital immigrant, this technology is not their default setting. It's not what they immediately go to uh, when, when they want to do something. It's not ingrained in their consciousness in the same way. Again, it doesn't mean that they're technologically illiterate or don't know how to use a computer or, or any of these tools. It just means that it's not part of them in the same way that it is for a native. So I want to go over a few myths about the digital natives. Uh, John Palfrey and Urs Gasser have, have wrote uh, one of the major books on digital natives, and uh, they've kind of come up with eight myths about the digital natives 
uh, that society sometimes propagates. And I just want to go over three of the major ones uh, for our purposes today. And the first one is that digital natives are wasting their time online. This is a common complaint we sometimes hear from parents that, oh, my kid is just spending too much time in front of that screen. Well, that may be true, but the point I want to make here is that not all screens are created equal. To be kind of flippant about it, I mean, sometimes you say, oh, I wish you'd just go read a book. Well, a book is a type of screen. It's a surface on which there is media that we take in. But it's a very different type of media, a very different type of screen than the television. The television is a very static, passive experience. You sit down, you watch it, there's not a lot of imaginative process going on in the brain. All the images is there, all the information is right there. There's not a lot of mental work required to watch television. On the other hand, there's a lot of mental work that's required to read a book. You've got to read the words, process it, understand the meaning. Uh, if it's, you know, a, a narrative, you know, often you'll picture what's going on so that your imagination is being involved in creating the scene, maybe filling in the gaps that the author didn't quite fill in. So there's a lot more work involved in reading a book than there is in, than in just the passive experience of watching a television. My contention, and I think the science is beginning to show this, is that the computer is much more like a book than it is like a television, which is a little counterintuitive. Uh, and certainly as we see kind of a, a proliferation of television on the internet, uh, you know, that may shift a little bit. Uh, certainly, you know, watching a show on a computer is not much different than watching it on the TV. But for these other sorts of experiences that digital natives are doing on the computer, it's much more like a book. You know, there is interactivity there. When a teenager is sitting in a chat room typing with two, three, four, twenty people, uh, you know, they're involved in a conversation. And so the communication centers of their brain are being used and developed. They're having to process the information that's coming in from the other people, assimilate it, respond to it, uh, engage in the back and forth of a conversation. So they're actually doing something in that space. It may not look like a conversation did 20, 30 years ago, but it's still a type of communication, a type of conversation that's going on in real time. Similarly, uh, natives are doing lots of creative things on their computers. They're creating videos and uploading them to, to sites like YouTube or or My Catholic Voice. Uh, that's a creative endeavor, you know, to shoot the video, edit it, put in any effects or music or things like that. So they're involved in a creative endeavor there. It's not just the passive experience of taking in media, it's media creation. That's what these tools are allowing natives to do is actually become television producers in a sense. Now they may not have the real sophisticated kind of tools that uh, NBC or ABC or any of those have to make their shows, but they are making their own media and sharing it with folks from around the world. When young people are sitting in front of the computer screen, they're actually learning. They're getting information from other people. They're looking things up on Wikipedia and other sites with information on them. They're gaining skills. When they're creating that video, they're learning about design and digital editing. I think we sometimes forget that these are marketable skills now. Marketable skills for jobs that didn't exist 20 years ago. So it may look like just kind of messing around, but they're actually lear learning skills that's going to find them a job one day. This is also true in the communication technologies that they're using. Things like Skype are preparing them for video conferencing and other things. So when they go in to apply for a job, they can say, yeah, I've been doing video conferencing since I was 12 years old. You know, it's old hat to me. I know how to do that. You know, and on top of that, they're learning collaboration skills. You know, when they're doing those videos, they're often having to direct, you know, their friends as actors or... Uh, being the, the the director and you know one's an editor and so they're they're working on this together and they're having to learn the kind of back and forth of what it means to work on a project together so they're developing skills for collaboration and building relationships you know that's the kind of skills that we tend not to think about when we just see them out there you know messing around with that video camera in the backyard well they're actually developing some skills that are going to be uh, for the future jobs very marketable so they're not just wasting time in front of a screen they're actually uh, involved in creative processes uh, and, and building skills that will serve them for a lifetime. The next myth I'd like to look at is that digital natives are a homogenous body. And this is pretty demonstrably not true. One distinction I want to make is uh, not all young people are digital natives. You know, that's not the right way to look at this. You know, there is still a very real digital divide in this world. Uh, especially when it comes to, you know, sort of lower class versus middle and upper class. 
you know, not all people have access to the internet. In fact, a very small portion of the world population has access to the internet. Even those that do have access to the internet, not all of them have access to the kind of tools to be able to build media and do these sort of interactions. So we need to be con cognizant that just because we're dealing with young people in our, in our schools, in our PSR classes, doesn't necessarily mean that all of them are going to be digital natives. And even within people who could be considered digital natives, there's still a wide variety of uh, interest in the tools, access to the technology. So we can't just assume that a one-size-fits-all approach is going to work in our classroom. Uh, you know, uh, can't assume that just one thing is going to work with all the kids. We still need to make room for the individual needs and the individual skill levels of the students in our classrooms in order to really make use of these tools. So don't think that a digital native is a digital native of a, is a digital native. There's, there's lots of differences there uh, that we, ne we need to take into account and still look after the individual. And lastly, uh, I'd just like to talk a little bit about privacy. You know, we have kind of this notion that Teenagers these days don't care about privacy. They'll post anything to Facebook or onto the internet and highly appropriate and all that. And while there's some truth to that, certainly there's there's um, teenagers who don't use the tools appropriately or are engaged in inappropriate activities that, that wind up online, I think it's unfair to say that digital natives don't care about privacy. Uh, studies are showing that privacy concerns actually very largely among young people based on age, based on the amount of education, based on whether they've had a bad experience in the past uh, having something appear online that they didn't expect to or didn't expect to be used in a way that it was used. So uh, again, it, there's, there's a, a continuum here that we need to be aware of in terms of attitudes from digital natives. The real question digital natives tend to ask is privacy from whom? They tend to have different standards for privacy, different standards for who they'll allow access to their information based on who the expected audience is going to be. So they may open up a little more to friends. You know, friends may have a lot of access to their Facebook information or the different things that they're putting out there. Maybe a little bit less for family because you don't want mom to know what was going on Saturday night. Uh, but then, you know, they really start drilling down on privacy when it comes to things like giving out information to service providers, businesses, the government. Uh, so, you know, they, their circle of friends they tend to see as a very open group and, and will tend to allow a lot of access there. But as that, that circle gets wider and wider, they'll tend to drill down a little bit more on privacy and restrict access uh, much more than for people that they, they actually know on a face-to-face -face basis. So, again, the, the, the real question for them is uh, not just privacy in general, but really looking at the individual audience uh, that they're sending information to and, and deciding what their expectations for privacy are there. So that kind of leads us to the question then of how do digital natives learn? And I want to start with this, start this section with a story and I, I wish I could play the audio clip. I'll have the audio clip uh, uh, on my website uh, that you can download and listen to uh, from a, an interview that Don Tapscott did. Don Tapscott uh, has written two great books about digital natives, Growing Up Digital and Grown Up Digital, uh, kind of tracing the first generation of digital natives and the impact that they're having on education and now the workplace and kind of what that means for those two sectors. And Don tells this great story about uh, a time when he was doing some consulting work a couple years back with Florida State University. And he was in kind of a, a group discussion in a, in a room with some administrators, uh, pro professors, and a few students. And he was kind of talking about digital natives and the different ways that they take in information and process information and kind of talking about these issues. And one of the deans looks over at a student named Joe O'Shea and says, Joe, you know, what do you think about this? You know, d d how are you reacting to this? And Joe says, well, you know, that, this makes sense to me. I can kind of see myself in what he's talking about. For instance, I don't read books. And all the professors and administrators kind of rocked back in their chairs. And Joe says, you know, I think I know what's in books. And if I need to know, I can always look it up on Google Books. But, you know, I tend to just get my information on the web and assimilate it that way. Well, Don Tapscott was very interested in this kid. And it turned out that they were both kind of headed in the same direction uh, after the conversation and so Don invited Joe to kind of ride along with him so he could uh, interview him a little bit and find out a little more about him so 
Don asked him, you know, kind of tell me a little about yourself. What kind of student are you? And Joe said, well, I'm a straight-A student. You know, I'm pretty good. And Don said, well, tell me a little bit about the activities that you're involved in. And he said, well, I'm president of the Florida State Student Council. You know, I've got a multi-million dollar budget that I, that I have to take care of, and I'm on multiple committees and doing all that, very involved. I uh, talked about his girlfriend, who is from New Orleans, and after Hurricane Katrina, he and she wanted to do kind of something to help out, so they went to New Orleans and helped to establish a medical clinic. And as of the time that, you know, Don tells this story, that clinic was still up and running and helping thousands of people a year get, get medical assistance after Katrina. Uh, Don asked him a little bit, well, tell me about your, uh, your family. So, well, it's kind of a, a sore subject right now. My parents recently passed away. But I, I play World of Warcraft online with my other siblings. And that's kind of a way for us to be able to, to talk and, you know, keep together as a family. And Don, you know, said, well, what are you doing after graduation? Joe says, well, I'm going over to London. I'm going to do some master's work over there. Oh, where are you going? Oh, I'm, go I'm going to Oxford. You know, just one of the hardest places to get in the world. And Don says, well, you know, you got help. You got a scholarship. Yeah, I, I've, got, I've got the Rhodes Scholarship. Now, Don loves to tell that story. Uh, on the one hand, you know, Joe's kind of an outlier. You know, not every, everyone who doesn't read books is going to be able to have that kind of level of success. But Don likes to tell that story because here's arguably the smartest kid in Florida, and he doesn't read books. Now that has got to tell us something about the way that digital natives take in information, assimilate information, and learn. You know, that the smartest kid in Florida can get away without reading books. That means something. <laughs> so there's two kind of themes that I just want to mm, throw out there about digital natives and learning. And the first is that uh, when we look at the way that digital natives are using technology and the internet, they're using them primarily as tools for communication and interaction among their peers. Now this is very different from the way digital immigrants and adults use the internet. Uh, the internet for most adults tends to be just a big repository of information. So I go to the, in the internet with a question, look up the answer, and then that's it. You know, it's like a big encyclopedia, a big dictionary, a big directory of information that I can go and access. But then, you know, that's kind of the extent of it. It's just a place to have questions answered. Natives, on the other hand, are really using it for communication, for interaction. This is kind of what we mean when we talk about Web 2.0. You sometimes hear that term thrown around. Well, what people mean when they throw that term around is this kind of evolution of the web from a static, uh, basically content-based place into a place where people are actually interacting. This new Web 2.0 is about facilitating conversation, interaction, connections. Think about places like Facebook or uh, you know, YouTube or My Catholic Voice, these places where people can share what they're doing, can share information, comment on it with one another. You know, Amazon's actually a really good example of this too. Just with all the reviews that they have of books and movies and music, people sharing what they think, creating this huge pool of meaning that people can tap into and interact with and add to. You know, that's a it's a very a very different way of thinking about the internet from the early years when it was really just about static pages sitting on the screen and, and reading. So, and digital natives are really masters at this connection making through technology. Again, think about uh, Don Tapscott's story. You know, here's this kid who's using the internet to keep in touch with his family and keep his family together, uh, m maintaining a, a medical clinic and, and looking, helping to look over it from, uh, you know, hundreds of miles away. Uh, you know, that simply wasn't possible 10, 20 years ago. You know, the tools are out there now, and, and these these digital natives are using them. As a result, though, digital natives really expect that sort of interaction in the other environments they're in. Uh, you know, so that if they're in that classroom environment, they want some give and take. They want to be able to question. They want to be able to, to put their own uh, thoughts out there for other people to take in and, and talk about. They, they want that give and take. The second kind of theme that I want to point out in terms of digital natives and learning is that uh, digital natives, when they do consume information, tend to do so differently from uh, older generations. Specifically, they, they tend to take in information in a very nonlinear fashion. So for instance, digital natives tend to read differently than digital immigrants. Uh, they, their brains just have been kind of trained differently in the way that they read. So they don't read right to left, up to down. They don't read, you know, 
one line, one line, one line. They tend to scan a text to get the, per the pertinent information, to get the, uh, uh, the kind of um, gist of the material, and then they go on to the next one. So they're not going to be as inclined to take a book and read it front to back. They're going to kind of skim through it, get the ideas, and move on. Now, this is one thing that may actually be somewhat advantageous for them. Uh, I know when I was in college and grad school, professors would say all the time, don't think you have to read the entire text front to back. Skim it. Get the pertinent ideas. Take out what you need to take out uh, so that you're not going to be overburdened by all this reading that we're assigning you. Digital natives have been doing that since their youth. Uh, and this is really just, the internet in general tends to encourage that. Uh, for whatever reason, people, immigrants or natives, when they read the online, uh, tend to skim rather than read front to back. Uh, if it's something really big, you know, really important to your job or, or to your interests, you might read it. But, you know, if you're reading a blog or something like that, people tend to just skim really quickly. And we're just kind of getting to the point where authors are getting to be aware of that so that they're starting to write differently for online material than they do for print material. But anyway, that's, you know, just something to be aware of is that they're, they're going to tend to skim. That's why, you know, bullet points can be really good for natives because it's a way to really quickly get the salient points and move on. Now, kind of a corollary to that is they're going to tend to jump from thing to thing really quickly as well. Because they're scanning, giving information, moving to the next thing, uh, we tend to say that digital natives are good at multitasking. That's not exactly true. Uh, in fact, I just saw a study, I think, the other day that seemed to indicate that true multitasking uh, is pretty much confined to less than 5% of the population. Most people cannot truly multitask in the sense of doing multiple things at the same time and devoting proper attention to them. You know, you can read and have the television on at the same time, but for most people, they're only concentrating on one at a time. They're not really going to be able to tell you exactly what went on in both the television and the book at the same time. You know, very few people can do that. Digital natives, though, are very good at switching tasks quickly. And again, this is something that may serve them well in the workplace, in one respect at least. If you think about, if you're sitting at your desk typing a memo or an email or something, someone knocks on the door, you know, you have to divert your attention away from the email to the person at the door, interact with them, answer a question, and then turn back. Digital natives find that very easy to do. They are very good at switching their attention quickly. Most uh, adults and digital immigrants, on the other hand, find it very difficult to switch their attention and then immediately focus back on what they were doing. They tend to have to take a minute, read back through what they had already written, get back into kind of the mind feel of what they were doing, and then they continue writing that memo or email. Now, you know, it's you know, not a huge amount of time we're talking about here, but it's, it's a skill that more and more people are going to need in this sort of knowledge-based economy, this sort of uh, ability to deal with interruptions and, and switching your mind's focus from one thing to another very quickly. So digital natives are going to have kind of an advantage in that sense. On the other hand, it also means that they tend to have shorter attention spans than previous generations. And so that may be something that they're going to have to at least be cognizant of and uh, adapt for the workplace. Uh, you know, it may not be that they're necessarily spending less time on something, it's just that that time is broken up into shorter chunks and is interspersed with other tasks in between them. So that's something that, uh, that we're just going to have to be aware of as digital natives come into the workplace. So what does this all mean? How can we put this into practice in our catechetical programs? Uh, I like to give three sort of general principles and then go into some concrete examples uh, of how to do this. My first general principle is you need to be willing to try to use these tools yourself. Even if you're a digital immigrant, uh, that doesn't mean you can't learn how to do these tools. It doesn't mean you can't figure out how to make a video and post it to YouTube or get involved in Facebook. It may be a little bit more of a challenge for you. It may take you a little more time. It may take a little more work. But you can do it. Uh, if you don't have the tools, you're going to need to get them. You know, my suggestion there is, you know, make a wish list. You know, know what it is you want to accomplish, and then kind of make up a list of the tools you're going to need to accomplish that. So maybe it's a laptop. Maybe it's a digital recorder to bring into the classroom. Uh, you know, make that wish list, and then take it to the people who are in a position to help. And, you know, I'd say start with the, the parents of your students. 
you know, I, I'm always just incredibly gratified to see how willing parents are to help out teachers when they know what the teachers need. You know, I see this in my son's classroom all the time when it comes to Christmas or something like that, and the teacher says, you know, this is what the classroom needs if you'd like to get us a gift or something like that. And, you know, the gifts just pour in for these teachers. So if you just let the parents know what you need, they, I, my experience has been they are very willing to help out however they can. You might also take it to your diocesan office. I don't know how other dioceses do it. I do know my diocese has a, a small endowment set aside for faith formation, and we give out you know small grants every year to be able to purchase equipment, to bring in speakers, those sorts of things. So there might be an opportunity to go to your diocese and ask, you know, could we get a small grant or something in order to be able to purchase these tools that we need to do this new catechetical program? Uh, and finally, you know, if you're in a position to do so, if you're a DRE or something like that, uh, you know, put it in your budget for the next fiscal year. Uh, the worst your pastor can do is say no, and you just might find out that they've got a little bit more uh, lying around one year, and, uh, you know, that's the year that you're able to get that digital video recorder or something like that. So, you know, just uh, don't, don't be afraid of the no. Just put it in there, and if that's not the year, just keep putting it in there and, until you get a yes. Be the persistent widow, as it were. <laughs> My next general principle is uh, we as catechists, we as catechetical leaders need to be where our students are. You know, they're out there on the internet making these connections. We should be one of those connections in some way. So, uh, you know, if our students are going to be interacting in these virtual spaces, we need to have a presence there. Not because it's the cool thing to do, not because everyone else is doing it, but because if we are truly called to spread the gospel to all corners of the earth, I, you know, I, I have to believe that that includes the virtual spaces as well. The church needs to be there as part of our mission of evangelization, as our mission of catechesis, to be where the people are and, and to interact with them in those spaces. You know, that's why things like Theology on Tap have been so successful in some places. It's meeting people where they are uh, in a slightly different setting than they might normally be used to. You know, taking people outside of the normal setting for a catechetical experience uh, can help them see things in a new way and help them to be attentive in a way that they might not be in a more familiar space. So doing that even in virtual spaces, I think, can be uh, can be an advantage. And finally, uh, when you're in the classroom, because of the way that digital natives like to interact, uh, catechists are going to need to be open to questions, uh, clarifications, comments, students injecting their own thoughts into the conversation. You know, uh, natives are used to this two-way com communication. Uh, the one-way sort of lecture, sage on the stage style, uh, will not be as effective with them. They can do it, you know, they can adapt to that, but it may not be as effective with digital natives uh, as allowing more of a conversational style, more of an opportunity to question and give some pushback. Uh, you know, it's, it's what the natives are used to uh, in their communication with their peers. Part of how they learn is through that interpersonal communication. Learning really becomes a community activity, so they want to wrestle with these questions, ask each other about them. What do you think? Well, you said this. Did you mean what about, you know, they're going to want to do some of that, uh, especially the older students, as, you know, especially as they get into those ages where they're going to start naturally uh, pushing back on authority as it is. You know, that's just going to be augmented by the way that they're used to communicating online. So just to be aware that uh, it, it's not necessarily that they're questioning authority or trying to be a pain. It's how they learn, it's how they communicate, it's how they talk. So we just need to be aware of that and kind of roll with those punches a little bit. So some concrete examples. Uh, and these, I'm just throwing these out. This is by no means an exhaustive list. Uh, but just, you know, some thoughts I've had and that, uh, some interesting projects I've seen elsewhere for how to kind of use these principles and this knowledge about how digital natives consume information and, and put them into practice. One thing you might consider doing is setting up a face group, Facebook group for your PSR class or your classroom. Uh, and I say set up a group as opposed to actually friending anyone, uh, any of your students on Facebook. I'm very reticent uh, about teachers friending students uh, on Facebook. Uh, certainly, you know, definitely check your parish or your diocesan policy to see if they have a social networking policy, and by all means, follow that policy. Uh, but, you know, if it's uh, within your power to do so, set up something like a group. The nice thing about groups on Facebook is it allows people who are not friends on Facebook to still come together into a space and be able to interact around a common subject. 
uh, and then you as the teacher can be kind of the administrator of that and it happens in a very public space you know and you can allow the parents even if they're on Facebook to hook into that as well to be able to see what's going on uh, again you know my my general rule of thumb is I would never friend anyone on Facebook or MySpace or any of those uh, under the age of 18 unless they're a blood relation to me you know there's just there's too many potential pitfalls uh, real or imagined uh, I just don't think it's a good idea so but again check your parish your diocesan policies and, and follow those here's just one example from a, a parish in my diocese Holy Family Catholic Church in Granite City has set up a, a Facebook group for their parishioners now so this is really kind of a whole parish group but it'd be very easy to set up something like this for a PSR program or something like that as a way for them to kind of talk about what they've learned about as a way to get information out to them set up links uh, for additional information those sorts of things so that's something you can look into something else that uh, we're starting to see is blogs for PSR programs which I think is a great idea there are lots of free tools out there like wordpress.com uh, to set up free blogs I mean wordpress.com you can set up a blog in about you know less than five minutes a very simple uh, blog and you can use that to again post links and resources for students and for other people to take a look at if your parents are online a lot you can keep them up to date on what's going on uh, you know one example I know about is St. Thomas Aquinas Parish in East Lansing Michigan has a wonderful blog where they post, you know, if there's any uh, letters or anything that have gone home, they'll post them there so that parents can read them there. Uh, every week they post their learning objectives for each of the grades. They post the homework for each of the grades so that all that information is out there for parents to be able to access and double check on. Uh, you know, it's a, a real nice way and, and just letting the parish community in general know this is what we're doing, this is what you're supporting. Uh, you know, it's a, a great way to. Uh, put information out there in an easily accessible way and in a way that's not going to cost you anything you know these these tools are all real easy to use and free so there's not uh, there's there's no excuse financially not to do it <laughs> another thing you could do especially for older students is ask them to set up their own class blog and so they can post what they're kind of reading about and thinking about for each week uh, you know you don't have to do all the work yourself uh, if you've got older students uh, who you you know think can be responsible with it you know ask them to post stuff as well so that it's not just your voice but you're getting the whole class involved in sharing these experiences another tool that I haven't personally used but quite a few people have, have given good reviews is Flocknote Flocknote is a system for being able to send out information to people but the nice thing is they get to get that information however they want so you can go into Flocknote, uh, create a group for your parish or your PSR group, and then parents or students or whoever can become members of that group, but then they specify that they the way that they want to receive information. So when you log in and type in, you know, let's say uh, PSR is canceled this Friday, uh, and send that out, well, one person might get that as an email. Someone else is going to get that as a text message. Someone else will get that on their Facebook page so that you know the the information delivery system is personalized so that you know if you've got some families that really prefer email or some that really like text message they can decide how they want to receive that in the way that's going to be uh, most accessible and most likely to be read by them now what I would love to see is to see people start using this for youth groups you know, I, my guess is you know most of the, the teenagers in your youth groups have already got cell phones with texting ability if you were to set this up for your youth group and then get them all to kind of put their information in there you could do things like you know send them a little daily prayer or a daily uh, scripture quote or a quote from a saint you know as a way just to kind of be able to interject little bits of the faith into their daily lives who knows they might even then forward them on to other folks but you know it's a it's a system that very easily lets you get information to people in the way that they want to receive it so Flocknote is something uh, I, I think we're going to be seeing more of that in the future. I'm a big proponent of also, you know, creative endeavors on the part of students, helping them to use the creativity, using the skills that they're already learning through uh, their online experiences, and bringing that to the classroom. Uh, <laughs> this was a very interesting project uh, that uh, a, a, a teacher, an English teacher, I believe, posted online to kill a mockingbird in the 21st century. Uh, what she did was she had her students uh, read To Kill a Mockingbird and then create mock Facebook profiles, blogs, chat logs for the characters in the book. 
So it was a way of, you know, imagining, you know, what would Scout's Facebook profile look like? What would a chat log between Boo Radley and Jem look like? And she had them write these out, not actually in Facebook, but just, uh, you know, in Word or some other computer program and just kind of mock them up to what it might look like. And it was really a, some really create, creative ideas came out of that. Now this, you know, doing this for a book is one thing, but it would be very easy to adapt this to uh, a scripture story, to various biblical figures, to the saints. Uh, so, you know, imagine what, uh, what Mary Magdalene would tweet about after the resurrection. What, what would that look like? You know, what would she be saying to the folks following her on Twitter? Those sorts of things, uh, you know, your students, I, I imagine, would, would bite into that pretty easily. Uh, you know, they already know those tools. It's just imagining, helping them to think about the, the things they're learning about in the classroom and adapting that uh, to the 21st century technology. There's lots, lots of opportunities also to bring video now into the classroom from the Internet. Uh, lots of great video blogs, uh, podcasts, those sorts of things are out there uh, about the faith. This is just one example of that Catholic show, and they've only got just a few episodes, unfortunately. I, I think they do just a wonderful job of kind of giving little 10, 15-minute videos about some aspect of the faith. Their video on confession is just excellent. They do a wonderful job of presenting the Sacrament of Reconciliation in a lively, engaging way, while still you know, bringing some good theological and faith formation information to it as well, helping people to kind of reflect about, you know, this is how we do the sacrament, this is what we mean, but in a way that's, like I said, very lively and engaging. So, you know, you could download that and show that as part of a supplement, maybe to your textbook learning, those sorts of things. Or, you know, if you have a blog or something like that, post them on the blog so that folks can watch them at home. Better yet, even though, you can get your students to create their own videos and post them to places like My Catholic Voice or YouTube. Uh, you know, we've kind of reached a point where digital video cameras, like this flip video camera I've got on the screen now, uh, these things can be purchased for less than $100. Uh, the flip video and, and kind of the different ones, that, kind of in that family especially, I mean, a very easy point-and-shoot video recorder, and then literally you just plug it right into your computer and it uploads everything directly for you. So, you know, again, if you can get a couple of parents to kind of donate a little bit to be able to go towards that purchase, uh, get that tool, and then you can just give it over to the students and say, make a video about some aspect of the faith. Uh, if you want some examples, mycatholicvoice.com is kind of a Catholic YouTube, and there's lots of examples there of student projects doing this sort of video creation for things like uh, creating a commercial about Mass. So, you know, what, what would a commercial trying to encourage people to go to Mass look like? Uh, I'd love to see someone, you know, do like a, a news interview with the, the parish pastor, you know, do kind of a mock news show uh, or a panel with, uh, you know, the catechists and some other folks from the parish. You know, what would that look like? And then being able to upload that and share it with other people, not just within the parish, but f again, from around the world and kind of building on these ideas. And oh, isn't that neat? And you know, there's a lot of creativity going on out there that we can we can take part in and share. We've even gotten to the point where you don't actually even need a video camera to, to make impressive little videos. Uh, there's a service called Animoto, which will allow you to upload still pictures, you know, taken with a digital camera or something like that. Uh, upload those still pictures, and you can add a little bit of text, choose some music, and then it crunches that all together and adds some special effects and makes really impressive little 30-second videos, uh, which are free to create. Uh, if you want to do longer ones, it's like $3 a video or something like that, but, you know, really nice, sharp, little snazzy videos uh, with music and special effects and everything that can be stringed together from just still pictures. So that could be an interesting little collage project, a video collage project for a class to do. Go out and take some pictures and then upload them to make that video. Uh, and again, that's a, that's a free service. It doesn't cost you a thing besides just the time and effort to get the students involved. You know, my, my real kind of point in, in giving these examples is just to say that I think we can do a lot to engage students uh, in ways that are going to tap into the skills and the abilities that they already have from their work online uh, to help them to collaborate uh, with each other and put together all this information in creative ways and share it uh, with each other and, and you know just kind of help build that pool of meaning together uh, for one another as, as a class or as a parish or, or as a group. So you know uh, I just really encourage you to get out there, try these tools, uh, see what works and we're still in that period where this is all new, so don't feel like you have to be an expert. Believe me, none of us are. <laughs> uh, we're all learning about this together, so I'd, I would love to hear uh, from you if you have any success in this. Please, uh, please let me know.
I'd like to close with a brief prayer. Uh, this was a prayer for vocations for young people written by Archbishop George Lucas of Omaha. So we'll begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, fill the hearts and minds of your young people with the power of the Holy Spirit, so that with courage and generosity they might answer your call to serve the Church in the priesthood and religious life. Give parents the faith, love, and spirit of sacrifice, which will inspire them to rejoice when a child of theirs is called to a church vocation. May the intercession of the Blessed Mother and St. Joseph, your holy family, help us to pray, Let not my will, but yours be done. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for listening. Uh, the links to all the articles and tools that I've talked about can be found on my blog, which is just at jonathanfsullivan.com. Uh, just search for Digital Natives, and uh, that information should come right up for you. Uh, also, feel free to follow me on Twitter if you're there. I'm at twitter.com slash sullyjo. That's S-U-L-L-I-J-O. Uh, and I'd love to, to interact with you as well there. Uh, you can also, if you have any other further questions, or, uh, you know, again, if you have any success in this, I would love to hear about it. You can contact me through my website. There's a, a little contact me link uh, at the top of the page there. So thank you again for listening. God bless you uh, and all of your ministry uh, on behalf of the catechetical mission of the church. Take care.